So we're going to jump in, if that's all right with you. Acts chapter 16 is where we're going to be. Acts chapter 16, verse 16, all the way to verse 34. If you do have a Bible, which I just want to encourage you, every single week, bring a Bible to church. Could be on your phone. That's totally fine. And take notes in church. Uh, Because we leave this place and we forget the message. We forget what God spoke. And it would be so helpful and beneficial to have notes to look back on in a week or two or in a year or in five years to be like, oh yeah, I remember that message, but what were the specifics of it? So I just want to encourage you, just always do your best to lean in. As you come with expectation, God's going to meet you in that expectation. But If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to hook you up with one. Janelle mentioned you can get one at the Info Center. Uh, If you're watching online, email us and we will mail one to you. Um, I just want to let the production team know that I cannot see my time right now. And so that is dangerous because I'm a preacher and I love to talk. And so I will be up here until next Sunday if you don't give me a countdown. Um, And so I don't know. if, If this goes long today... You have full permission to find Stephen. Okay, I see it now. But Stephen over there, and you can say, Stephen, I missed lunch. I missed dinner. I missed everything because of you. No, we got the clock now. We're good. But um, follow along with me, and let's read together. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to 34. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So there was this girl, she had owners, and she had this spirit, uh, this demonic spirit that allowed her to tell the future. She was a fortune tell her, teller, and her owners would charge people money to have their fortunes told, their futures told. And she followed Paul and us, us is the author, this is Luke, crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Imagine you're going out your business, you're you're walking around and someone's like, they're a Christian, they're sharing the gospel, they're preaching the gospel. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but, but she kept doing this for many days. And Paul didn't like it. He became greatly annoyed. And he turned and he said to the spirit, not the girl, to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, these are the the authorities, the judges, they said to them, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in in attacking them. There's a lesson there. The crowd will always join in in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison in maximum security, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, singing worship songs to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So if the prisoners had escaped, he would have been killed. So he was just beating them to the punch. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So there's a lot here, a lot to unpack, a lot to talk about. But again, I do believe from this text, God wants to encourage us and speak to us and grow and expand and enlarge our faith this morning. Before we continue on, 
let's pray and just again invite God into this space and to move in our lives. God, we are, we are aware that you're here. You're here moving in our lives. You're in our homes, wherever we find ourselves. You're here. God, we don't just want to acknowledge that you're here. We want to encounter you. And so I pray that you would meet every single one of us exactly where we're at. And God, no matter what we are walking through, would you speak to our situations? Would you encourage us in our situations? Um, we all come with different stories, different baggage, different pain, different struggles. And you are a God who uniquely speaks to each of us. And so we invite you into this space, God. We invite you into our lives. We know you are a gentleman and you will not force your way into our hearts. So we invite you and we pray, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it may be, do a work in our lives. We want to become more like you. and We want to know you more, Jesus. So move in power. We thank you so much for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is alive and active, moving in our lives today, this very hour and forever. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. So, I love success stories. I love a good success story. I love to be inspired. I think we all love to be inspired. Like, I love when I'm going on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, and then all of a sudden you get that, like, business entrepreneur underscore motivation underscore one, two, three account that randomly has a video that has a sponsored ad, and it's like some person who went through some hard thing, and they're inspiring you, and you watch it, and it's like 45 seconds, and you walk away feeling like you can conquer the world. Like, I love those moments. I'm like, I'm getting a gym membership. I'm I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to get my life in order. I'm going to be a success. I just love success stories. For whatever reason, we are drawn to them. And I feel like especially I'm drawn to them. I just love to watch. My favorite genre of, of, of movie, film, or, or book is, is biography or autobiography, documentaries. I love it. And I love it when they chronicle and track and, and retell the story of some person. I love learning about Michael Jordan or, or Walt Disney. Disney or, or Steve Jobs, and yes, these men and women who we watch and we learn of their success, they are flawed and make mistakes, but it's really, really incredible to me to watch these people start from oftentimes nothing, and they persevere, and they work hard, and they have an idea, and they have a dream, and then they become successful. It inspires me so much to watch their stories and read their books and learn from them, but there's a common thread throughout every single person who is a successful person. If you look at their lives, if you compare their lives, every person who has ever made a difference, whether in business or in social justice, people like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr., all of these people, whatever field they were in, if they were successful, if they're inspirational, if they inspire people, they've all walked through something and share a unique trait. And that is that they have endured great pain. Every single person that you are inspired by, every single person that you look up to, every single person that we idolize, celebrate, esteem, they got to where they are because they have endured great pain. Without pain, there would be no success. Now, pain isn't fun, obviously. You know, they say things like, no pain, no gain, right? Um, I heard someone say, no pain, no pain. I, I like that, you know. <laughs> pain isn't fun. But the reality is, is that pain is a part of being human. Pain is something that all of us have to go through. All of us have experienced pain. I'm very aware even that in this room right now, a great number of us and those watching online, a great number of us are walking through pain struggle, suffering, trials and challenges. There are a great many of us who are stressed and worried and burdened and just don't know what tomorrow holds. There are those of us in darkness, in the valley. Pain is a, a part of our lives. And so I want to be very sensitive this morning 
to the fact that we're walking through pain um, even now, but I want to talk about pain. I just feel it so strongly in my heart that God wants to address our pain, that God wants to move in our pain and encourage us in our pain. And when we look at this story we read a moment ago, the story of Paul and Silas in the city of Philippi, we find them experiencing great pain. And it's interesting because this pain comes out of nowhere. We kind of pick up the story and they're going to the place of prayer. They're doing ministry. They're sharing the gospel. They're telling people about Jesus. They're doing what they were made to be doing Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Let me tell you about this guy who saved my life. Like they're doing good things. And as they're going about their business, telling people about Jesus, they continually are interrupted by this girl who has a demonic spirit. And this demonic spirit gives her the ability to tell the future. So she was quickly, this was capitalized on. And some men came along and said, we own you now. And they began to make a profit off of this girl's oppression in the demonic realm. So they would charge people, they would pay money, and then their fortunes would be told. Every time Paul and Silas walk by this girl, she starts yelling at them about what they're doing. Hey, they're serving Jesus. Hey, they're sharing the good news. Hey, they're talking about the cross and the resurrection. And it's not wrong what she's doing, but it makes Paul frustrated. He's like, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to stay low key here. I'm trying, to do, I'm trying to do my thing and you keep disturbing me. So he goes to the spirit and he casts it out in the name of Jesus. Of course, everything bows down to the name of Jesus. So the demonic spirit leaves. Therefore, this young girl loses her ability to tell the future. And so the owners, rightfully so, get angry because they've just lost their business. Now they have no way to make money. And so they're angry at Paul and Silas, and they go to the authorities, the judges and the rulers, the magistrates, and they make a claim against Paul and Silas. These men are ruining our way of life. What they're preaching isn't lawful. What they're preaching isn't good. They're talking about this Jesus guy, and really they're just mad because Jesus changes everything, and they don't want anything to change. They want to keep making money, keep, uh, keep oppressing this young girl. And so the magistrates are angry, these business owners are angry, and the business community looking ahead, realizing that their business could be affected as well, they join in as well, and they start attacking Paul and Silas. And they're not just threatening them, they are physically beating them. The message translation says they are beaten black and blue, unnoticeable. They just go after these guys. And after they beat them, they throw them in prison. But it's not just enough to throw them in prison. They throw them into the inner prison, which is maximum security. And when we think of prison today and prison back then, they are very different things. Prison back then was a cave. It was filthy. There are rats and mice and bugs. There is no climate control. It's either extremely hot or extremely cold. These guys are shackled to the, to the wall, which is not a wall. It is rocks, jagged and sharp. They're beaten and thrown into prison. Pain is inflicted upon them for no reason. They have done nothing wrong. And I want to make a point to say that pain is a part of the journey. We have to understand that. If you're taking notes, write that down. That pain is a part of the journey. Paul and Silas were not sinning. Paul and Silas were not in a place and space they should not be. They were not doing anything wrong. In fact, they were doing everything right. They're casting out demonic spirits. They're telling people about Jesus. They're making a difference in the city of Philippi. And yet they are thrown into this prison where they experience great pain, great suffering, great trial, great agony. Because pain is a part of the journey. I think so often in life, we correlate pain to something negative. We often see pain as a punishment. 
Oh, if I'm hurting, if I'm struggling, then I must have done something wrong. God is punishing me. My friends, that is not who our God is. That is not how it works. Pain and being human are synonymous. You cannot remove them. We've been sold this bill of goods that is just completely false, that if you do the right things and say the right things, even in Christian circles, if you have enough faith, If you pray hard enough, if you show up to the right places and spaces and read your Bible enough, then you can avoid pain. It is just not true. It is a part of the journey. It is part of being human. I want to read for you Matthew 5, 45. It says, so so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. But watch this. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. and And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Good is a part of life and bad is a part of life. We are going to experience pain. Jesus spent a great deal of time in the Gospels warning the disciples, hey, just so you know, you're going to experience a lot of pain. I want to prepare you for what you're about to experience. And I think right now we need to be prepared because so many people in our culture right now, and this younger generation, which I love so dearly, They walk away from their faith. They walk away from Jesus. They reject him entirely because of pain. Because they have been expecting, which pain, by the way, is your unmet expectations. Every time you expect something and it doesn't happen, that is pain. But they expect this perfect life, this good life, immediate promotion, immediate wealth. But when they're met with pain, they are conflicted and struggle even more. We need to be prepared to experience pain. Whether you are good or bad, doing the right thing or the wrong thing, you will both be blessed and experience pain. Peter even talks about this. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. We're like, what's going on? I'm in pain. Expect it, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none suffer as a murderer or a thief, as an evildoer or a meddler. So this is what Peter is saying. Suffering for the kingdom and suffering because of something else are, are different. When, you, when you're building the kingdom, you face resistance, and that pain that you experience from that resistance is different from the pain you will experience from, well, we inflict pain upon ourselves. Other people inflict pain upon, our, upon us. We inflict pain upon others. And we live in a fallen, broken world. This world is sinful. This world is in a state of decay. Just like God is redeeming and renewing this world through his church. But all of these things are going to bring about pain in our lives. But the pain we experience as followers of Jesus for building the kingdom is different. It is a resistance that comes against you when you are building the church, advancing the kingdom. When your life is sold out for Jesus and your life is about ministry and making a difference in people's lives, you will face resistance. You're going to face pain. It's a part of the journey. You cannot escape it. It is unavoidable. I know that's not good news. The good news is coming. The good news is coming, I promise. But Paul and Silas are are sharing the gospel. They are ministering to people. And they are beaten and thrown into prison. What happens next is crazy. Like, I don't know if you caught it and you were like, what in the world is going on? So Paul and Silas are in prison. They're seated for sure, no doubt. And their arms are shackled. Can you see me still? Two weeks in a row, I end up on the floor. (laughs) Their hands are shackled. And it says that at midnight, midnight, what is midnight? I haven't even seen midnight in years. But it's midnight. They're shackled in this prison, and they're praying and singing songs to God. If I was in this prison... I would have been shackled up, laying there. I would not be upright. I'd be laying there, just lay down. What if I fell asleep right now? (laughs) I'd be complaining. I'd be like, under my, like in my head, I'd be like, this sucks. God, what the heck, man? Like, I'm building the church for you, man. I'm sharing the gospel with people. 
Like I literally am here because I cast a demon out of a girl who was oppressed. She was a slave and I helped her and I'm in this prison. Are you even real? Like what is happening? <laughs> I'd be like, yo, yo, Sai, this sucks, right? Like this is so stupid, right? And I get angry and I get worked up and be like, I'm never doing ministry again. I quit. I quit. I tell you it's over. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just going to st stick to my tent making business. I'm going to do that. It's, it's more profitable. I don't end up in prison. I'll just keep to myself. I'll just stay quiet. That's what I would do. But Paul and Silas are chained up in this prison. Paul's like, yo, Sai, I reckon it's about midnight. I reckon. <laughs> we should probably sing. We should probably worship God right now, hey? Like, he's here with us. You know that, right? Like, I know it sucks that we're here, but, like, God, God is here with us. And, I mean, shoot, we wouldn't be here without the good news. We're here because of the gospel. We're here because Jesus came to this earth and Jesus was betrayed by his people. He was murdered on a cross after being tortured. And he was placed in a grave. And there was a stone rolled in front of it. But he didn't stay in that grave. He rose from the dead. He resurrected. He beat death. And he revealed himself to us. And now the Holy Spirit lives in us. And the power of God is at work in our lives, moving us, and leading us, and guiding us, increasing our faith, increasing our devotion, teaching us, showing us the way that we should go. Man, I, I don't want to be here. It hurts. I'm in pain. My body is aching. I can barely see because my face is so bruised, but I just want to worship because I still love Jesus. And he's still so, so good and so kind. Can I tell you something, church? The greatest remedy to your pain is your praise. Paul and Silas make a decision. I'm in pain right now. I'm in this prison right now, but I'm going to worship anyways. Because praise precedes preference. I don't feel like worshiping. I'm in prison. But it doesn't matter how I feel. Because he is worthy. And he is good. And he is kind. And he is with me. And he is for me. The posture of the Christian in pain is to praise. Is to worship. Is to move towards Jesus. To be honest with him. To be authentic and real. See, my worry when I say this is many of you will think, okay, so the next time I'm in pain, I just got to sing. I got to endure and grit my teeth and just get through it and, and really fight to put on a front and be like, yes, our God is an awesome God. Yeah. Amazing grace. Thank God we have a great worship team, right? <laughs> but many of us, when we find ourselves in the prison, in the pit, in pain, we think, oh, because I'm a man or a woman of faith, I must pretend to be okay. No, we do not pretend to be okay. We come to Jesus as we are not okay. We don't say, God, I'm fine because you're good. We say, God, I'm in pain, but I know you're good. I don't feel like worshiping, but God, I know that you love me and I love you and you're for me and you're here with me, so I'm just going to lean into your presence. Even though I don't feel like it, we don't fake it. We move into Jesus in faith. It's not faking, it's faith. It's okay to show up feeling like, man, I, another Sunday, I could be sleeping in, but I woke up early to serve. I woke up early to come to church, but I don't, I don't feel like it. It's okay. It's not okay to come here. Everything's fine. I'm good. God is good. Thank, thank Jesus for the cross. No, no, no. God can handle your emotions. God can handle your cussing. cussing. God can handle your anger. Like, I don't, I don't cuss in front of you, but you better believe I cuss in front of Jesus. 
Don't judge me, by the way. I'm just being honest with you. God can handle it, invites it. The greatest remedy to your pain is your praise. Getting into his presence, running into him. It begins to turn our perspective. As Paul is, Paul and Silas are, are praying in the prison, singing in the prison. It says that the prisoners are listening. Can I tell you something, church? This isn't part of, the, well, it is part of the sermon now, but it wasn't in my notes. Um, people are always listening. What is your song? What are you singing? What are you telling the world? They are always listening. They were worshiping God, audience of one, but the prisoners were listening. Your life as a follower of Jesus is is under a microscope. And everywhere you go, you are an ambassador of Christ. You represent him and you represent his church. Just want to let you know he trusts you with that, with that banner, with that responsibility. But as they're worshiping and they're praying, all of a sudden there's this earthquake Everything starts to rumble and and shake. Dust is falling. And the doors are broken and they fly open. And the shackles that were around their wrists and their legs are loosened. And they are free. They were in prison. They were in pain. And now they're free. I want to encourage you this morning that your pain won't last forever. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Because you know it, but you don't know it. Your pain will not last forever. Hang on. Keep going. Keep trusting. Persevere. Endure. Stay faithful. Stay committed. Keep showing up. I get it. Pain is not fun. Pain is discouraging. It is demoralizing. It's demotivating. When I'm in pain, I just want to lay in my bed. When I'm in pain, I just want to lay down and do nothing. We got to keep showing up because it will not last forever. This is the hope of Jesus. This is the good news that your pain will not last forever. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. There's another text, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day day for this momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen how God is working in the supernatural for the things that are seen are transient they're here today and gone tomorrow but the things that are unseen are eternal so here's what these two scriptures tell us there is a future to come We refer to it as heaven, where we will be in the presence of Jesus. All those who have bowed their knee to Jesus said, God, you are Lord of my life. I live my life for you. I give it to you. It's yours. Your kingdom is is what my life is about now. I'm not living for me. I'm living for you. I receive the cross. I receive the resurrection. I receive the Holy Spirit. There is a place for those people. We call it heaven, where God will wipe every tear away. There will be no pain. There will be no mourning. There will be no weeping. There will be nothing but dancing, rejoicing, and partying. Come on. But that place, we're caught in this weird in-between where it's, where it's already here, but it's not already here. But we can experience this heaven. We can experience this renewal. We can experience this joy and this hope and this goodness now. God is wiping away our tears now. He will wipe it away for eternity in the future, but right now he comforts us and he wipes away our tears and he walks us through a season of mourning and he gets us through the season of, season of mourning. When I'm in pain, I feel like it's the only thing that exists. It's the only thing that matters. I'm, I'm, I'm out, uh, outnumbered by enemies. I'm overcome by pain and heartbreak and weeping, and grief, and suffering. And I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. 
And today God wants to make us very, very aware that pain is temporary. If you find yourself in a prison, do not lose heart. Keep worshiping, keep praying, keep serving, keep loving him. I'm telling you, friend, the jailbreak is coming soon. The prison doors that you find yourself in will be will swing open and the shackles will fall off your wrist. Stay faithful. Keep your eyes on him. I cannot tell you the time. I cannot tell you the place when that will happen. I cannot tell you how that will happen. But I know that we serve a good God and that that will happen. As they, as this happens, this earthquake happens, it frees them. And the jailer becomes aware of it. He's awoken because this is midnight after all. He wakes up from this earthquake and he sees that the, the doors are open. And he thinks to himself, everyone has escaped. I failed. My job is, well, I failed my job. The punishment for such a thing was death. So he thinks, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take my own life, alleviate the suffering, do it quick. As he's about to take his own life, Paul and Silas yell out to him, stop. We're still here. We haven't gone anywhere. And this man is so blown away by what has just happened. The fact that they would stay because they knew what would happen to this man. In their moment of running from their pain, they were still considerate of this man. And he's so blown away that he's like, okay, hey, whatever is in you, I want in me. Whatever you are, are whatever God you're following, whatever power you have, that would cause you to be broken free from a prison and yet you didn't run, you thought about me, I want that. And so they share the gospel with this man and he believes and he's so overwhelmed by the love and the kindness and the grace of Jesus, he takes Paul and Silas to his family and his entire family is saved that very moment. They all say, yes, this is what I want. This is what I need, I need Jesus in my life. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I want a relationship with God. This is a game changer. I want, I want him. Their entire family is saved and baptized, which can I just say uh, in, in May, on May 1st, we have baptism Sunday. How do you know if you're ready for baptism? Do you believe in Jesus? If you do, you're ready for baptism. Some of you, I want to encourage you to sign up to get baptized. You haven't taken that step yet, but you're a follower of Jesus. We look at this story, this man and his entire family, they believe and were baptized. There is no getting ready. There is no getting your life in order. There is no figuring it out. There is no following Jesus for a decade. And then you get baptized. It is, I believe, and I'm going to tell the world and my friends and my family that God has changed my life. So some of you need to go to rosechurch.ca slash baptism and sign up for Baptism Sunday. We'll walk you through all of the details. But I find it so interesting that in one of the darkest moments in Paul and Silas' life, in a discouraging time, in a season, in a moment of great pain, they are able to minister in such a profound way. And here's why. This is a principle we need to begin to understand. Purpose is birthed out of pain. Purpose is birthed out of pain. Some of your most incredible ministry moments will come out of your greatest mess. Your most powerful, profound platform will, will be your pain. God is in the business of redeeming our pain. And what the enemy used to tear us down and thought would crush us, God allows us to stand on it and minister from that place. Your pain becomes your platform. And in the midst of your pain, God gets you through it, redeems it, and uses you to walk this other people through their pain, their life, their discouragement, their issues. I love it. These guys are coming out of prison, and they're leading people to the Lord. Just because you're going through something doesn't mean your ministry stops. You still have purpose in the midst of your pain. And, and I just believe so strongly. I look at Scripture, my experience talking to friends Purpose is actually birthed out of pain. When you walk through pain, on the other end of that is purpose. It's like childbirth, right? Giving birth isn't fun. It is painful. I haven't experienced it, but I've heard a lot about it. I was there in the room. I saw it happen. It's not fun. Being pregnant is difficult. 
But on the other end of it, you have a baby. Purpose. The pain led to purpose. Something profound and significant was born out of the suffering that you endured. Do not write off your pain as meaningless. There is a lesson. There is a purpose. There is a destiny in your pain. If you would acknowledge in your pain, there's something that God wants for me in this pain. You could easily miss it. Or you could become aware that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life in the midst of your pain and you can grab onto it. Let me be very clear, though, that God did not cause your pain. But God will not allow you to go through pain for no reason. So if you're in pain, because we live in a fallen world, right? It's unavoidable. It's a part of the journey. God's like, hey, if they're in it, I'm going to make sure that it adds value to their life. So every loss, every, every moment of suffering, every heartbreak, every moment of agony, God will invite you through the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem that moment of pain. And it will become something that launches you into your purpose. I'll never forget. In Bible college, a number of years ago, our last year, we had a president of the school who at the end of the year, he would take the entire graduating class, I don't know, like a hundred students. He would just take his time and he would prophesy over every single student. I have no clue what he said about anyone else, but I'll never forget what he said about me. He said, Mark, you are going to be a spiritual father to generations. If you know anything about my story, you know that I've grown up without a father. I have never met my father. I don't know his name. I don't know what he looks like. He has never once been a part of my life. But how is it that this president, Stephen Herzog, would prophesy over me that I would be a father of generations? It's because purpose is birthed out of pain. And everything that I endured, everything that I went through, every, every moment of suffering, every, every question, every longing, every desire that was not met would prepare me to minister to other people. And are we not seeing this happen right now? Where I have the opportunity to journey alongside people, lead people, guide people, Say, hey, I'm available if you ever need. I'm your pastor. I love you. I'm in your corner. Literally watching it unfold. But I'm here today because of pain. Rose Church is here today because of pain. Pain is what birthed this community. Getting here has been very painful. Anything that matters, anything that means something is going to cost you. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful but be encouraged that there is purpose in your pain. I want to read for you 12, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, focusing on this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before Jesus? It was you and I. What are you and I? We are the purpose of Jesus, redeeming us, liberating us, restoring us in relationship with God. Jesus endured the cross because he knew that on the other end of the cross was his purpose, was his joy, was us being here thousands of years later. Jesus' purpose was actually birthed out of his pain, and so it is with you and I. And as we begin to close today, I want to encourage you that Jesus is always with you in your pain. He is always with you in your pain. He is always with you in your pain. And some of you are here today, And you're in pain. And you think the reason you're in pain is because God has abandoned you. God has forsaken you. He's given up on you. He's not fighting for you anymore. Oh, man, I I must have done something wrong. Oh, man, I must have really blown it if God hasn't intervened yet. Does he even like me anymore? Does 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 he even want me anymore? Okay, I'll I'll read my Bible more and I'll show up to church consistently and I'll start going to connect group. Maybe that'll make God like me. I just need to, but friend, he's, he's never left. 
He's always, he's always been there with you. It's funny because I read this story and I realize as I read this story, I haven't factored in that God is in this story. I read this story as Paul and Silas were doing ministry. They got beaten and thrown into prison. There was this earthquake because they sang hymns to God. The doors flung open. They left. This guy was saved. But I'm like, wait. God was aware that they were there. He knew everything that was happening to get them there. He was with them the entire time. His presence was felt and experienced in the prison. He is the one who caused the earthquake. He is the one who caused the doors to swing open. He is the one who caused their shackles to fall off of their wrists. He was with them the entire time. As you walk through this life, pain is unavoidable. It is a part of your journey. But we can be encouraged. We can take heart. Because God is with us. This is the good news. What is the gospel? What is the good news? Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in just the good? No, 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 no. God with us 24-7. You cannot escape the presence of God. You cannot mess up enough. You cannot make enough mistakes. You cannot run fast enough or far enough to outpace, outwit, outrun the presence of God. He is always with you. And even in those prisons, even in those moments where you have no hope and you're in a state of despair and discouragement and you feel like he isn't there, let me remind you today, he is there. He is with you. Grab a hold of this truth today and keep it in your heart for some of you need it today but some of you will need it tomorrow Psalm 34 18 the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed in spirit when people are in pain what does God do he draws near C.S. Lewis says that God whispers in our pleasure but he shouts in our pain. Pain is his megaphone. He is not gone. He is attempting to make himself more present, more tangible, more clear than ever. Pain reveals who God is. We learn and grow the most in the midst of our pain. Why? Because it's in our pain that we see Jesus so clearly. As we are helpless and we cannot walk and we cannot move and we cannot get ourselves out of the mess that we find ourselves in, we see Jesus step in. And as Jesus steps in and he scoops us up and he carries us out of the prison, we begin to realize, oh, so that's the kind of God you are. That's what you do? I thought this was just about going to church on Sundays. Turns out he's a little more invested in our lives than we realize. And what you care about, he cares about. What causes you pain, causes him pain. Why? Because you are his child. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are his beloved. What does he do when you're in pain? Psalm 147 verse 3, it says he heals. He heals. Your pain won't last forever. It's temporary. Why? Because he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. And it's not momentary. It doesn't happen like that. It is a process of healing. This is why we need to take the mask off and be real. God can't heal you who you pretend to be. You got to be real, vulnerable, raw, authentic. This is a safe place. God is a safe person for you to be real with. But he wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. And you better believe he is not afraid of your mess. He is not tempted to run away. When you mess up, when you sin, he is not in heaven hitting the red button. Code red, code red. God, I don't know what to do about this one. No, no, no. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because it's handled. He's got your sin covered. He's got your pain covered. Your soul is secure in him. Your hearts are held in his hands. This is our Jesus. This is the God we worship. This is why Paul and Silas in the prison, they did not complain. They did not moan and groan. They did not just go to sleep. They worshiped. 
Matthew 11, 28 says this. This is the invitation of Jesus while we were in our pain. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know what to do when you're in pain? Come to him, all who labor, all who are heavy laden, all who are weary, all who are tired, all who are broken, all who are angry, all who are discouraged, all who are dismayed. Come to me, and I will heal your pain. I will restore your pain, and I will give you rest and peace and joy and life and purpose and meaning and a destiny. This is who our Jesus is.